Hello and welcome to this year's season of Climbing on the Bookshelf. I hope you all had a great Christmas and New Year and looking forward to what the year holds for 2022. I just thought I'd sneak in a quick episode before I get started with the real stuff as we go into Season 2 on the 30th of January with a new episode, which was an interview I did back in November and had a great and interesting chat. I really enjoyed that one. So look out for my show when it drops on the 30th of January from wherever you get your podcast from and don't forget to rate, review and subscribe once you've listened. Also, here's a great chance to catch up on Season 1 before you head on to Season 2. There are some really great chats and books talked about. This sneaked in episode is about my all-time favourite mountaineering book, Conquistadors of the Useless by Lionel Terry. It's been discussed and used several times and referred back several times since the start of my show, so I thought it was about time I put it in. Please excuse some of the sections of the episode as I had to record them in different locations, so the sound will be a bit different in places, so please be patient. Thank you. Enjoy. Lionel Terre is perhaps one of the most prolific climbers of his era, spanning 32 years from his first alpine season in Chamonix at the age of 12 to his untimely death in 1965 at the age of 44, whilst on the easier upper section of the Arc de Circle crack. He climbed a massive 67 routes, most of which are in the Alps, but some around the world too, including, and I'll try and keep this to the ones that I've heard of, but saying that I've heard of most of them, but the ones that stick out are as follows, and please excuse my mispronunciations. In the Alps, there was the Bravant, the Clocheron de Plampras, Aguil de Grepon, the Aguil de Moines, the Aguil de Pellerins, the Col de Poitiery, the Petit Drou, the Aguil Vert, the Aguil Noir, Le Droite, the Grand Jurasses, the Matterhorn, and the Eiger, which is of special note as this was the second ascent in 1947, nine years since the first ascent. Um, there were numerous ascents on the Eiger after the first ascent, and he climbed it with his climbing partner, Louis Lachanel. Further afield, there was Fitzroy and Patagonia, Aconcagua shortly after summiting Fitzroy, Makalu and Makalu II, Janu, and then in Alaska there was Mount Huntington, then back to the Himalayas, to Annapurna. Um, this was the first 8,000 metre peak to be climbed. Now, in that team for, that climbed Annapurna, there were quite a few well-known climbers, um, such as, obviously, Lionel Terre himself, uh, Morris Herzog, who was the leader, his climbing partner Louis Lachanel, Gaston Rebefat and Jean Cousy. After a reconnaissance mission to Dalagiri in April, their team summited Annapurna on the 3rd of June. Um, Herzog and Lachanel were the only people to summit, but on the way down, um, the attempt turned into a bit of a survival struggle involving Lionel Terre and Gaston Ribafat coming to the summiter's aid. Eventually, they got down safely, but Herzog and Lachanel were badly frostbitten, um, but they were okay, really, I guess. Terre also made his first film in the Andes in 1952 called La Conquête de Huansan, and then, in the same year, made La Grande Descente de Mont Blanc. Both films won prizes at the Trento Festival. I'll now go on and read a couple of extracts from the book. Hope you enjoy them. I have given my whole life to the mountains. Born at the foot of the Alps, I have been a ski champion, a professional guide, an amateur of the greatest climbs in the Alps, and a member of eight expeditions to the Andes and the Himalayas. If the word has any meaning at all, I am a mountaineer. In apparent contradiction to this way of life, it so happens that I have to give a great many lectures illustrated with slides. One evening, after one of these lectures, I was invited for a drink at the home of some local celebrity. A dark-suited professional man came up, looked me intently in the face and said quietly, You interested me very much, monsieur. As I muttered my thanks in some conventional phrase or other, he went on, But what do you normally do for a living? An engineer? A teacher? The good man could not hide his surprise when I replied, Not at all, monsieur. I am a mountain guide, pure and simple. I began to realise that the rather storybook life I had led had made me into the person of unusual duality. 
I saw that for anyone seeing me for the first time, in collar and tie and lounge suit, giving a lecture on the human geography of the Himalayas, I bore no resemblance to the real man behind the worldly facade, the mountaineer, that figure of which a conventional literature has fixed in everybody's mind as a rough, crude, mannered peasant. And so, for the first time, I appreciated the full strangeness of fate which had turned a child born to a family of middle-class intellectuals into a conqueror of the highest and most difficult mountains in the world. In a few days' time I shall be forty years old. Twenty years of action on the mountains of the world have left me with more energy and enthusiasm than the majority of my younger companions. Yet I am no longer altogether the same person who once rode roughshod over men and the forces of nature to victory on the Walker, the Eiger, the Fitzroy and Chakraraju. So many years of trial and danger change a man in spite of himself. Shortly after our return from Janu, I was crossing the Fresne Glacier with a client when we were surprised by an avalanche of seracs. My companion was killed and I was buried under fifteen feet of ice. At that moment, it seemed as though an insolent look, which had hitherto walked by my side and abandoned me at last, but in fact, by one of the most amazing miracles in the history of mountaineering, I emerged without a scratch. Imprisoned under a block of ice at the bottom of the crevasse, I managed by a series of contortions to reach a knife, which I had by sheer chance left in my pocket. With its aid, I was able to reach a cavity in the debris, which once again had formed close to me by the merest luck. With an ice peat on and my peg hammer, I then carved out a gallery towards the light. Five hours later, I reached the fresh air. This stay in the antechambers of death, where yet another companion was lost at my side, ripened me more than ten years of successful adventures. In every adventure, whatever my nominal capacity, I have marched with the van. The expeditions, or in the Alps, I have accepted every risk and responsibility with a tranquil mind. If I have sometimes led others into danger, I have never hesitated to stand by their side. Today my willpower is no longer quite so inflexible, the limits of my courage not so far out. In the assault on the most redoubtable bastion ever invested by a group of mountaineers, will I still be a captain, leading his stock troops in the last charge? Or will I have changed into a general who waits in fear behind the lines while his men advance into action? And after Janu, what? Will there be anything left to satisfy man's hunger for transcendence? This book is one of my all-time favourites of mountaineering literature, not only because it has the best name of any mountaineering book ever, but because it also has detailed accounts and personal stories that draw you in to what life and climbing was like in the 30s, 40s and 50s. They had such rudimentary equipment, leaving the climber with just the skills that they developed, and on such difficult and technical routes, even by today's standards. So, if you want to read a classic piece of mountaineering history, then this is the one to get absolutely brilliant. It's a story for those who love and know the mountains, and also for you non-climbers out there. I get the feeling that he wrote it to explain why the need to always climb higher and higher, and how there was purpose in conquering something so useless. The book covers his first conquests, his time during the Second World War, and how he met his climbing partner, Louis La Chanel, and other fascinating and informative writing on his other mountain climbing expeditions. There is also a detailed account of all his ascents, so this book really does cover literally everything he's ever done, and it really does put him in the category of one of the greatest climbers and mountaineers of all time. You can buy the book from Mountaineers Books in the US or from Vertibook Publishing in the UK. I guess it's up to you really where you get it from, but I'll put a link in the show notes to those two um, that should take you straight to the book's page. Many thanks to Mountaineers Books for allowing me to read my chosen extracts. It's really appreciated. Also, thank you so much to all of you listeners and subscribers to the show. I really appreciate your support in me. Making this podcast is still enjoyable and it gives me hope and enthusiasm to make more episodes. One last thing, it would be really great if you could give my show five stars, whichever platform you're listening from, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Acast or podcast addict or even a web browser you can also follow and message me on instagram and twitter at climb bookshelf or write me a note the old-fashioned way via email 
climbingonthebookshelf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to Climbing on the Bookshelf. Thank you.